All right, so moving right along here in the chapter on shamanism in primitive mythology, uh, we've got the third section here called the shamanistic vision. The last section was on shamanistic magic. So we've seen examples of sh what shamans can do, what their magic is like, and what makes people afraid of them. Now we need to look at the visions that they have during their initiation uh, rites that transform them from uh, average everyday citizens into, let's say, uh, these kind of sh superheroes. These shamanic characters are, in, in a way, the world's first superheroes. They're presented that way in myths. You see a lot of structures between shamanism and superhero comic book mythology. There are a lot of similarities. Shamans, too, have x-ray vision like Superman does, for instance. They can see through uh, living beings to their internal skeletons, and consequently we have x-ray style art, which is typical of shamanic art, which extends across the board from Europe, across Siberia to the New World, as well as down through Africa, uh, where the skeleton of an animal is lit up from within. Uh, that's because the shaman can see into the skeleton of an animal and light it up. And he's got abilities to fly through astral travel. He transforms himself into a bird. Uh, shamans usually turn into birds when they go into their uh, archaic uh, trans flights of uh, ecstatic rapture where they leave their bodies, their astral bodies, leave their physical bodies, go into the astral plane, as we'll see here in a moment, and uh, commune with the spirits and then come back. Um, so they can fly also like superheroes. So all the basic abilities, I think, that are later attributed to comic book superheroes first are found amongst uh, shamans in their myths. I want to read you here really quick before we get going. This account here, um, I don't usually like reading things because I think it's boring, but um, to just listen to the monotony of someone reading, it's more li lively to remember it. But uh, in this account, this is an account from uh, a Tungus shaman, uh, and the Tungus shamans are in Siberia, named uh, Semyonov Semyon. He says, when I shamanize, the spirit of my deceased brother Ilya comes and speaks through my mouth. Uh, my shaman forefathers, too, have forced me to walk the path of shamanism. Before I commenced to shamanize, I lay sick for a whole year. I became a shaman at the age of 15. The sickness that forced me to this path showed itself in a swelling of my body and frequent spells of fainting. When I began to sing, however, the sickness usually disappeared. After that, my ancestors began to shamanize with me. They stood me up like a block of wood and shot at me with their bows until I lost consciousness. They cut up my flesh, separated my bones, counted them, and ate my flesh raw. When they counted the bones, they found one too many. Had there been too few, I could not have become a shaman. <clears throat> and while they were performing this rite, I ate and drank nothing for the whole summer. But at the end, the shaman spirits drank the blood of a reindeer and gave me some to drink too. After these events, the shaman has less blood and looks pale. The same thing happens to every Tungus shaman, only after his shaman ancestors have cut up his body in this way and separated his bones can he begin to practice. So right there, we get the core myth of these visions, which invariably features the shaman dying uh, and his body being torn to pieces and then put back together and reassembled. So this is the primary shamanic myth. Um, we find it here, too. And uh, back to another Greenland shaman, this is an account that's not in primitive mythology, but it's in the historical atlas of a Greenland shaman named Outdaruda, who says that um, he learned shamanizing from a very old shamanic master who was so old that he could barely walk. And so they had to prop him up and help him with his kayak and so forth. Um, but this shaman uh, explained to him that he needs to see this event and that he was going to take him to a sacred spot. So he takes out Daruda to the sacred spot where there's a cave. The old man takes off all his clothes and he goes to lie in the cave and he says, just stay there and watch what happens. So then along comes a polar bear that goes up to the cave and attacks him, eats him, tears him apart limb from limb, eats all of him, and then vomits him forth. And apparently he's vomited forth whole again, I guess, because he says, every time the polar bear eats me, I have stronger shamanic abilities. So I have to endure this ordeal every so often. So a season or two passes, and the old man takes him out to Ruta to the same site, takes him up to the cave, and he says, now it's your turn. You must be eaten. So he goes into the cave, and he waits, and the polar bear comes, makes its way up, and does indeed eat out to Ruta. Limb, tears him limb from limb, eats him up, vomits him forth, and out to Ruta says, and every time I do this, my shamanic abilities are stronger. So there again, we find the same myth 
this time uh, in Greenland, amongst the Greenland Eskimo here. We found him in Siberia with a Tungus shaman, where the basic myth is that the shaman is killed, torn apart, and reassembled, in opposition to the food plant myth. Note that uh, the food plant myth is that a central protagonist is killed, cut up. Very often the head is just chopped off and planted like a seed. The skull in that myth becomes a sort of seed and is planted uh, like the plant seed is planted and up springs a food, a food plant from the body. Uh, whereas with the shaman, uh, the same individual is reconstructed. He's torn apart, disintegrated, and reconstructed. Only once he comes back, he has superior abilities. Now, Spencer and Gillen uh, recount amongst the central Australian tribe of the Aranda. Australia is broken into three different zones of Australian Aborigines. The northeastern zone, uh, which is heavily infected with planting culture myths, in which the rainbow serpent has female characteristics, and a southeastern zone, in which, uh, which is entirely patrilineal and uh, has no matrilineal characteristics at all, and the middle zone, the, the central zone, where the, the Aranda come from. And Spencer Gillen give this account of the Aranda uh, initiation ceremony. It takes place when an individual goes into a cave, as we saw with the cave in Greenland, goes into a cave and he waits there, takes all his clothes off and he waits there until he is shot in the back of the head. The ancestors shoot an arrow into the back of his head that comes through his, comes out through his tongue. And indeed these shamans actually have holes in their tongues that are large enough for you to put your little finger through. Um, so they somehow make that hole themselves. But the vision, the vision quest version of it is that they're shot by the ancestors. Then another arrow is shot through the ear and comes out the other and kills him. Uh, so he's lying there dead in the cave, and the ancestor spirits come, they gather him up, and they bring him back into the depths of the cave, and they take out his internal organs, they scoop them out, and put quartz in to replace the internal organs with quartz. This is a magical kind of quartz, not ordinary quartz, it's visionary quartz, subtle quartz, self-luminous quartz, sukshma quartz, the uh, Hindus would call it. Uh, but this quartz can, by a shaman, be projected into another person's body, uh, so that they can have quartz inside them that causes them illness, um, or they can retrieve it from another person's body, so they, they have the ability to do this. So the interior of the shaman is made of a totally different substance. And when the individual comes out, um, he's mentally deranged for a time until they put certain kinds of makeup on his face that center him and calm him down. And he's not allowed to shamanize for an entire year. And if during that year, the hole in his tongue heals up, then he's not going to become a shaman. So he's got to hope that that hole does not heal up. And I presume that in most, most cases it does not for him to become a shaman and he's good to go. So there again, there's the myth in Australia going inside of a cave. It doesn't always have to be a cave, as we'll see in a moment. Um, and the internal organs are replaced. New organs are put in. Uh, note the comic book character, the Marvel comic book character uh, Wolverine, uh, also undergoes a kind of shamanic death and rebirth when they put metal on his bones uh, as he's undergoing this kind of surgery that give him magical powers. That's a, a shamanic motif. And Wolverine, moreover, is a Native American character. Many of our comic book superheroes are Native American characters like Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, Batman, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do then is recount this myth, uh, this longer myth, uh, back again from Semyonov Semyon, uh, the Tungus shaman that we read, uh, who had one bone too many. And he gives an account of the shaman named Aija. And this is a, a, a Yakut shaman named Aija, um, who um, is a brother. He's the younger brother. He's 20 years old, and he's the younger brother of an older brother who's 30 years old, um, whose parents have died. Uh, but then the younger brother dies uh, at the age of 20. He dies. It doesn't say how he dies, but he dies. Uh, but while he's dead, he can still see everything around him. And he's wondering what, what's going on. He watches people go through the funerary rites, the burial practices. He watches them make his coffin for him. They put him in the coffin. And he's wondering why he can't talk or move or speak, although he can see all of this going on. They put him in the grave. They leave him in there for a while, and then after a while he hears this rumbling coming up from below, and he hears the bellowing of a bull, and this bull comes up out of the underworld, grabs him between its horns, turns around and takes him back down to the underworld. So he goes down into the underworld where he encounters a house 
uh, where an old man lives um, who sends his sons out to bring his body in from the bull, and he puts the body on his, on his palm. And he says, I need to weigh this, and we'll see what happens. So he weighs him, and he says, hmm, this is an individual who needs to be reborn in the world above, taken back to the middle world, the earth zone, in between the upper world and the underworld. So apparently the implication is that anybody who winds up down in the underworld and is assigned there does not get reborn or reincarnated. So the bull restores the individual to his coffin. He's lying there still awake, waiting when this raven comes along and picks him up and carries him uh, up to the upper world through a hole in the world's ceiling where he finds the giant world cosmic tree, a large tree in this case. And these central cosmic trees are, of course, the pole star around which everything revolves, which is central to shamanism. And it has nine levels to it, nine branches, but they bring him, uh, the bird brings him in to another old man who is there, only here the, it's the house that he lives in is made out of iron. All the houses are made out of iron. Uh, so he brings him in, and his, he has seven sons, each of whom has the head of a raven and the body of a man. Um, and the raven's sons bring in Aija. They bring him in to the old man. The old man puts him on his palm, too, and weighs him and says, Aha, he will be reborn up above in the ninth uh, branches. Take him up there to the ninth level. So the bird takes him up to the nest on the ninth level. They put him in this nest, and he's sitting there, and a reindeer comes sailing by, a white flying reindeer comes sailing by, lands on the nest, and he is to suckle from the tits of this reindeer for three years. And as he is taking in this nourishment from the reindeer, which is his animal mother, um, he gets smaller and smaller, his body grows smaller and smaller, until it gets to the size of a thimble. And he's up there and he witnesses the following events over the course of these three years. Um, he's there one day when uh, the bird brings up into the upper world, everybody's making a big commotion, uh, a brown-faced woman, it's, she's described as having a dark face, brings her up in there, um, and they throw this celebration. They're happy to have her spirit up with them, uh, but then there's an apprehension, and they decide to lock her away inside one of these iron houses. Uh, and then sure enough, you can hear the drumming of a shaman, boom, 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 and this, him singing as he makes his way up the cosmic tree and comes up to the upper world, and when he gets there, transforms his body into that of a bull, and takes his drumstick and puts it across his head, which becomes a single bull's horn that he uses to ram into that iron barn, breaks it open, grabs the woman, carries her back down to the earth. The old man isn't very happy about this, and he tells his sons, uh, apparently then what has happened, by the way, is that uh, a woman has been sick in the real world, and a shaman has been sent up to get her soul. Because the idea in shamanism is that when someone gets sick, their soul has been captured and taken into the astral plane. So the shaman has gone up there and brought her back successfully. Um, but the old man tells his sons, go get me another one. Get another one. So they go down and they bring up a pale-faced woman. They bring her up and they transform her into an insect. And they put her on the inside of a large tree, the, the cosmic large tree. They open a part of it, stick her in there and hide her in there. Hopefully the shaman won't find her this way. And they wait, and of course, here comes the bum, bum, bum of the shaman's drum, and he makes his way up singing, and he comes up, and he goes right to the large tree, breaks it open, grabs her, carries her, and makes off with her, takes her back down to the world below. But the old man's having none of that. He says this time he wants her back, the same woman, not a different woman, and he sends his sons back to go get her. They get her and bring her back, and this time the sons stand with fire sticks at the entrance to the upper world, and as the shaman tries to make his way up, sticks his head up through the hole, they burn him uh, and prevent him from getting back up there so he can't get up there. So apparently this is the soul of a woman who has died uh, down below on the earth. So meanwhile, Aija, up in the nest for three years, has witnessed all this going on. So he's seen all this, and finally the old man tells him, your three years are up, now it's time for you to be reborn down on the earth below, so let's go ahead and send you back down there. So he goes back down and he's reborn to uh, a woman there. Um, he has no memory of his past life as a 20-year-old who died young. No memory of the world tree and being up in the ninth uh, branches, the highest branch of the world tree. This is going to be a very good shaman. Um, until the age of five. And at the age of five, he does remember. Um, and I think this is an interesting aspect of this myth because Ian Stevenson uh, was the guy who made himself famous uh, as a scientist who studied 
and interviewed all these children from Asia who claimed that they could remember past lives. Uh, and they could remember, uh, they, could, they would lead the interviewer to places where they used to live and they would have all these vivid accounts of exactly who they were and where they lived and who their parents were. And apparently this five-year-old uh, shaman kid does remember, uh, although it's not until the age of seven that he's put through the initiatory process where he's of course torn apart and put back together again so that he can shamanize. And by the age of 12, uh, he has become Aja, the famous Yakut shaman. So he's already very good uh, at the age of 12. And he decides to go and visit his uh, brother um, that he used to know in the previous life and goes to visit him, but he doesn't say anything. And of course, his brother doesn't recognize him. And he sees that the woman who had been his wife when he was a 20-year-old has remarried. So they're apparently happy and that everything's fine there. So time goes by and he shamanizes for a while. And then one day, uh, there is a shamanic festival. Um, there's uh, something called the uplifting of the soul of the horse, some sort of Indo-Aryan type uh, myth type festival thing going on. And he, sees, he goes to this festival and he sees that the shaman who is there shamanizing is the exact same shaman that he remembered when he was up in the nest coming up to transform into a bull and to piss the old man off by taking away his souls, the, the women that he, that he had pulled back down to the earthly plane. So he recognizes him and he says that he recognizes him. And the rival shaman turns to him and says, oh, I remember you. When I went up the world tree, I remember seeing your soul up in the nest on the highest branch. I remember exactly who you were. Um, and I just suddenly now feels like his identity has been uh, uh, shattered uh, or at least exposed. Uh, and he says, how dare you expose the mystery of my birth to everyone present here at this festival? And the other shaman uh, says, well, if you have any evil intentions toward me, uh, you better eat me, devour me alive, uh, because I'm going to be reborn as another famous shaman from the eighth branch. And so uh, the myth ends by saying that that night, Aija did indeed take the life of this rival shaman. It doesn't say how he did it, just that he killed him. And so the myth illustrates uh, the whole cosmology of shamanism from the inside, so that we can actually see uh, on the other world what's happening when the shaman does indeed go into the trance, um, plays the drum, and ascends the cosmic axis, and goes to the other world and uh, the types of deities and spirits that he communes with on the other side. So it gives us an insight into that world and the rival between uh, shamans who are at war with each other. And so this is uh, the mythical, this is the magical, rather, the magical consciousness structure that Gene Gebser talks about. This is what it look lo looks like from within. And it is characterized by what uh, Borkenau, in his book, End and Beginning, calls death paranoia, which is something that he ascribes to barbaric societies in between world ages, like all the Germanic mythos, the Siegfried epos. They're all characterized by death paranoia. Uh, but I think we can say that the same thing is characteristic of the shamanic world of the magical consciousness structure in which death paranoia reigns because there is no such thing as a natural death. If someone dies, something has happened magically to that person. A curse has been put on them, uh, and a sh shaman has projected uh, an entity inside of them, a little creature that is living inside of them. There's no such thing as a natural death in shamanism. All deaths are suspected to be the result of magic that has been somehow uh, perpetrated against this individual. And so death paranoia, um, Borkenau's death paranoia, does indeed, I think, characterize Gebser's magical consciousness structure, which is uh, the earliest level of human religiosity. And it goes all the way back to the Paleolithic caves, as we'll see as we move through uh, these chapters here. But that's the basic core cosmology of shamanism, as Campbell uh, describes it uh, in this wonderful chapter.